Ren II, this band of warriors would traverse vast distances and win unlikely conquests in the very heart of the domain of Islam. The stories of El Cid and the First Crusade run almost parallel to one another, and when told together, they demonstrate the upheaval and adventure that characterized the late 11th century. October 1086, the battlefield of Sagrajas is soaked red with blood. The Almoravid ruler, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, and his army of 7,500 have just defeated a Christian force of 2,500. This is a major defeat for Alfonso VI, King of Leon Castile. Once again, the Christian kingdoms of Spain are on the defensive. Yusuf, who already rules much of North Africa, now wields power throughout the Muslim portions of Spain, and he is poised to expand into the lands of the Christians. Desperate for help, Alfonso sends an appeal to a man he knows to be a great warrior, but a man also exiled by the king himself. Rodrigo Diaz, a knight of Castile, was banished from his homeland years before. Now he serves as a mercenary captain for the Moorish ruler of Zaragoza. When Rodrigo receives the king's messenger, he's overjoyed and rides at once to the royal court of Castile. He kneels before Alfonso, who pardons him. Alfonso dispatches Rodrigo to the eastern Iberian Peninsula, where he authorizes the Cid to subdue lands held by Muslim rulers. In this way, Alfonso hopes to secure his eastern interests. However, the reconciliation does not last. Over the next several years, tensions between El Cid and the king boil over. Their relationship is a complicated matter, long debated by historians, and despite their clashes, El Cid seems to have always maintained that Alfonso was ultimately still in some sense his king. However, by 1090, El Cid is operating in the east mostly as an independent warlord. With a small army of loyal followers, he extracts tribute from local Muslim rulers and begins seizing castles in the region. Valencia's ruler, al Qadir, offers a lavish tribute, making himself Rodrigo's client. The Knights of the Cid are well paid with Valencian gold. Rodrigo, amazingly, with very limited resources, is establishing himself as an independent power in the Levant of Spain. However, Yusuf, one of the greatest generals of his generation, is on the move. He spends 1090 and 1091 mopping up the Muslim cities of Al-Andalus, taking Granada, Murcia, Cordoba, and Sevilla under his direct rule, imprisoning their Moorish emirs in African dungeons. From Yusuf's perspective, he is purifying the cities of Muslim Spain, which have grown corrupt under the soft, indolent rule of pleasure-loving Moorish princes. Yusuf is an austere and uncompromising warrior of the desert who loves the rigors of campaigning and scorns palace luxury. He is committed to the fundamentals of the Islamic faith and models his own life on the companions of the Prophet. If anyone can crush the Christian kings of Spain and restore Muslim rule to the whole of the peninsula, it is this man. And now, Yusuf's plan is coming into focus. He knows that Valencia is the key to his ultimate triumph. Once Valencia falls, Zaragoza will easily be subdued, and then the Almoravids can destroy the tiny Christian kingdom of Aragon. At that point, Alfonso VI and the Castilians will be penned in by a newly resurgent Muslim Spain. Within Valencia, civil strife is brewing. Many of the city's Muslims despise al Qadir for submitting himself to the Christian El Cid. Resistance coalesces around Ibn Jahaf, a prominent nobleman with pro Almoravid sympathies. In 1092, Ibn Jahaf organizes a coup. Violence breaks out in the streets. Amid the chaos, Al Qadir tries to sneak out of the city. He disguises himself as a woman wearing a jewel studded girdle. Ibn Jahaf's men storm the palace. They discover Al Qadir hiding in the harem baths and cut off his head. Ibn Jahaf now controls Valencia. He dispatches a messenger to the Almoravids, asking Yusuf to send a garrison to hold the city against El Cid. Rodrigo Diaz is at Zaragoza when he receives news of Al-Qadir's murder. 
Now, his very position in eastern Spain is at risk, and the Almoravids might easily overrun a vast and important portion of the peninsula. He understands the great moment that is upon him. The Christians of 11th century Spain revere old tales of King Roderick and the Visigoths and their battles with the original Arab conquerors. A Muslim chronicler from Valencia records El Cid as making this comment. A Rodrigo lost this peninsula. Now another Rodrigo will save it. At once, El Cid departs Zaragoza. He besieges and captures the fortress of Saboya, nine miles north of Valencia. He rallies his supporters, including Muslims who'd served Al-Qadir. Dispatching a messenger to Valencia, the Cid expresses outrage at Al-Qadir's murder and demands that the city be surrendered into his power. Ibn Jahaf refuses. Rodrigo answers with a solemn vow. He will make war on Valencia until he has made it his own. Our most important source for El Cid's life, the Historia Roderici, most likely written by one of the Cid's own followers, records how Rodrigo pressured Valencia. In the month of July, at harvest time, Rodrigo encamped beside Valencia. He began to devastate the crops with his horses and to destroy the houses outside the walls. When the inhabitants of Valencia saw this, they sent envoys to him, beseeching him to be merciful but he refused to grant them peace unless they expelled Ibn Jahaf and his party from Valencia. They were unwilling to do this and shut themselves up together in the city. Rodrigo's siege of Valencia begins in July, 1093. His army is too small to surround the city. He has no navy, so he can't affect a blockade from the sea. His strategy is to pressure Valencia through systematic ravaging of the territory from his fortresses of Saboya in the north and Berecadel in the south. By winter, Valencia is in a desperate state. No relief has arrived from the Almoravids, and the citizens are starving. In 1094, they hold out a few more months, but at last, in May, Ibn Jahaf agrees to surrender. El Cid enters Valencia. Rodrigo, with a small army and very limited means, has subdued one of the great cities of Muslim Spain. For El Cid, this was a moment of profound achievement. With his wife Jimena and his two daughters, Cristina and Maria, he climbs the highest tower and gazes out over the shining city, offering thanks to God for his bounty. Meanwhile, in Morocco, Yusuf ibn Tashfin hears of this outrage. He organizes a large army led by his trusted nephew, Muhammad. Yusuf instructs Muhammad that he is to capture Rodrigo alive and bring him back to Morocco in chains. At Valencia, El Cid gets news of the Almoravid advance. Ibn al kama a Muslim chronicler native to Valencia, was in the city during this tense period and describes the anxiety of the Muslim citizenry. Rumors circulate that El Cid will massacre Valencia's Moors before the Almoravids arrive. Instead, the Cid orders that all iron weapons and tools be confiscated. He also expels Moorish men of military age. By October, the huge Almoravid host arrives before the walls of Valencia. Inside, the Christians hear the thunder of Berber war drums as their enemies surround the city. Muhammad concentrates his forces on the level plain of Quarta. The Historia Roderici describes the anxiety of Rodrigo's knights. They were few in number, while the enemy outside the walls was immense and confident. But the Cid urges his men to take heart and to trust in Christ. Immediately, Rodrigo begins studying the enemy host and believes he has identified a weakness. The Almoravid coalition is immense, but may also prove unwieldy. The Cid believes that a sudden and forceful attack could spread confusion through the gigantic army. After a week, El Cid makes his move. Dividing his army in two, he dispatches the first contingent from the city in a sortie with such ferocity that the Almoravids concentrate themselves against it. Meanwhile, the Cid leads his second force discreetly from one of Valencia's lesser gates and falls upon the enemy camp. 
Just as Rodrigo had anticipated, the vast Almoravid host is slow to react to this surprise. The Cid himself rides at the head of his cavalry, tearing through the enemy ranks. Rodrigo and his knights spread confusion and terror until the entire Almoravid army breaks in a total rout. Rodrigo's victory is complete. He captures the Almoravid camp and distributes the vast booty among his men. The Battle of Quarta is the first decisive victory gained by a Christian Iberian army against the Almoravids. News of the Cid's triumph spreads far and wide. After the King of Castile himself was defeated by Yusuf ibn Tashfin, Christians throughout the Iberian Peninsula rejoiced to see the Almoravids proven vulnerable and Valencia successfully held. News of El Cid's victory may even reach Pope Urban II, for he has long been concerned about the situation in the Iberian Peninsula. Urban has recently taken direct action toward helping the Iberian Christians. He has even sanctioned their Reconquista as spiritually meritorious. Less than a year after El Cid's great victory, Pope Urban plans a new sort of military campaign for Christendom's other frontier in the East. Urban is a All right. Welcome to Coffee and the Crusades, everybody. That was a little Real Crusades history video to start us off. I thought we'd mix it up instead of the music we normally do. All righty, everybody. Welcome. Uh, let's see, Rand, are you there? I'm, I'm here. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was always okay. uh, it's always fun uh, watching some of those uh, the the um, the uh, the medieval twelve twelve uh, animations that go along with them. They're just they're just perfect. Yeah, I, I gotta say I love that. Uh, I do love that mod. It looks amazing. Um, it's kind of addictive to just mess around with it and you know see what kind of like for me. It's it's more about like trying to get you know imagery out of it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I know I'm always like, okay, let me put them over here and see what it looks like. And let me like, <laughs> come this way. And see. I mean, but, I've, uh, I've seen some, um, I remember watching that, uh, you actually narrated it. It was, uh, yeah, um, I know who you're talking about. You're talking the, about the, uh, Nettie. The Battle of Cussy. Yeah. He's, he's um, done a bunch of stuff for me. That guy's very holy talented. Holy cow. Like that was, uh, that, that was possibly hands down, like one of the best depictions I've ever seen of of that battle that there that like there's ever been and it was all just done by a you know it was all just done yeah. by a guy with a, with a total war war mod you know that's yeah um yeah Zytron's asking is it a total and war even, mod? Even yeah, like the, um, it's for Attila the the Attila version of total war if you get uh the 1212 medieval kingdoms mod it is pretty mm -hmm. cool so how's everybody doing? Welcome to Coffee and the Crusades. Uh, this is our show every Tuesday and Friday at 11 a.m. Central Time, 12 noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, if we want to add the West Coast on there too. But yeah, we do this every Tuesday and Friday, just kind of a hangout for the Real Crusades history community. Um, so this is kind of cool, guys. Uh, we got Rand with us today. A lot of you who've been around for a while will, will know Rand. He is a good friend, um, a uh, knowledgeable history guy, and uh, it's going to be good to have uh, Rand with us today. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a while. Um, God, I think the last I think the last thing I did with you was uh, like almost a year ago now um yeah we did that thing about the templars which is still yeah, awesome. yeah 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 I'm, I'm proud of that yeah and that, and that was a lot of fun i know it's I, I, I wish it hadn't been that long but uh you know life happens so <laughs> well we're here now so yeah uh so we got a lot of people here we got sam we got sheila we got uh zytron chris tom a lot of the we got lambert a lot of the regulars are already in the chat, so that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, guys, the way we do this is we just uh, talk about um, Crusades history or medieval topics. You guys can throw any questions out there that are on your mind. Um, I do have a video that's going to come out today, actually, about the Fourth Crusade called "Did the Byzant or Did the Fourth Crusade Destroy the Byzantine Empire?" So I think that'll be kind of a an interesting. Uh, 
Spicy and controversial. I know. <laughs> Let me show you guys the the thumbnail is really cool. I I'm I'm really happy with the thumbnail. Um, let me pull it up here and we'll we'll share it. But uh, I think that yeah, I I, I was kind of wanting to uh, do something that would kind of get people talking. Uh, which my animator, who's uh, a guy from Ukraine named Dennis, he did a great job on the maps for this one, and uh. That's that's a view of that in the background, but uh, but yeah, this is going to be the thumbnail. <laughs> I think it looks that's pretty awesome. cool. That's awesome. That's uh, the Doge of Venice, and then Baldwin the first of Constantinople, who was also the Count of Flanders. I mean, I'm kind of I'm a, so, maybe I'm a little disappointed that you didn't make you, you didn't like uh, you didn't like Photoshop an actual Doge face into the Doge, but. You know, that, that would have been an actual. What do you mean, an actual Doge face? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, you know the, uh, you know the Doge meme. Uh, you know the the. Uh, oh the yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. I know that would. Have been good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'd be, a, it'd, on, be a, it'd be a meta. It'd be a meta reference. It's, yeah, <laughs> I I do know what you're talking about now that you say that. And uh, Chris is pointing out that we just had uh, Richard the Lionheart's birthday, which was yesterday. I kind of forgot about that, but uh, that's right. And then that his birthday was the day after the Battle of Arsuf, which was on the seventh, which is kind of interesting. So uh, that must have been a pretty cool, pretty cool birthday present. And in other news, um, I'm reading this right now to talk about uh, the Fourth Crusade here. Uh, whoops, hold on. Uh, which, uh, is, which which book is that? The Latins in the Levant. This is really old. This is from uh, like 1907. Oh, okay. there's not a lot of there's not a lot of books like this. So like this is a massive history of the Fourth Crusade and then the Frankish occupation of of Greece, basically like the 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 Greek Crusader states. Interesting. Which uh, who who wrote it? Uh, it's a professor from the old days, William Miller. Okay. So yeah, you know I'm, that name doesn't ring a bell. I'm sure it's you know prop. There's been scholarship since then, but you know I mean again, there's not you don't really see much of this like just like an exhaustive book on. Right, on Latin Greece. So, well, and, uh, he, cool. he he would have been right about the same era as like uh, um, like Charles Oman, uh, like Sir Charles Oman, mm -hmm. or um, oh, yeah. some of those some of those some of those like very very early uh, historical writers who actually who actually did a, a fairly decent job at establishing a, a a decent foundation of you know where to look at and what what. Uh, you know what sources and, and the historiography, but, um, but but yeah, I mean, there's just been so much uncovered and translated and made available since then that yeah. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still interesting from a historiographical perspective to go back and kind of see like how they were talking about it back then. Yeah, and, and so far, I mean, it's very heavy on the narrative, like uh, which is kind of a, a fun thing sometimes about the the older books is just that they they do kind of give you more of just the story aspect mm -hmm. of things like this, then this, then this, you know, uh, which, which is, uh, which is cool. Um, I mean, I, I, I like uh, getting into more of like specific topics like culture, politics, religion, you know, like nice. broken up like that. Yeah. But I, do, I do like the narrative thing too. Yeah. I, um, I actually just got, well, I'm, I'm at the very tail end of it. Um, uh, I found it. I've, there, I have a, in the town I live right outside of has a phenomenal, um, it, it's a, it's a big college town. So there's, there's two big state universities up here. So, um, that there's a, there's a phenomenal recycled books store, um, up here where, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like two late, it's like two levels and all that. And the, the, the medieval history section is actually pretty decent. And it's one of those places where you can find like, you can find super awesome out of print, you know, books written by, you know, some of the biggest names out there and you can get them for, you know, eight bucks. <laughs> yeah. That sounds um, pretty awesome. Yeah. Cause it's just, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's books from either some former student or, you know, some, you know, professor who's retiring or something like that. And they just, they just show up to recycle books and basically just, you know, dump half their libraries there. Um, and uh, or but somebody's, no, that's, uh, somebody's scholar spouse dies and they just drop all their books off. There. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's exactly where probably a bunch of them come from. And um, I, the book I'm reading right now, it's uh, it's called um, The Capacians. And it's uh, oh. it's basically just a it's a history of the entire 
Capetian dynasty um, nice. in, from beginning to end, and it and and it it's not so much a narrative. I mean, there's there's some narrative aspects of it, um, but it kind of breaks it up into chunks, and then it goes into uh, uh, goes into um, like the the society, the politics, the 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 image of of the crown, uh, you know, of, of that time, the royal image, the uh, the economic, you know, situation, the 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 geopolitical situation at the time. So you kind of get this with each era of the Capetian dynasty, with kind of each um, period, you get a real good sort of in depth look at like what just overall French society was like, you, you know, during that period and, and what sort of things were going on in that time. So it's a really, really good book. I'll, 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 uh, if you're going to start uh, answering some questions, I'm, I'll, I'll uh, run off real quick and see if I can get the, uh, the author of it. Yeah. I'd like to check it out. Um, and let, let's see here. And yeah, uh, guys, the way this works is uh, just any questions you have, just start throwing them out there to us. And uh, Rand and I will start uh, talking about those topics. Uh, we've already got a few things coming in here. Um, yeah, so uh, real quick, it was it was it's called Capetian France, 987 to 1328. It's by, by a woman by the name of Elizabeth Hallam, H-A-L-L-A-M. Um it was just really, really well done. It was, yeah, it, it, and, it, and it provided a lot of insight. You know, it was, um, it, it obviously, you know, because the, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the apogee of the, of the Capetian dynasty was uh, St. King Louis the Ninth. Um, and so it, it spends a lot of time on him uh, and, and on, you know, the things that he did during his reign and uh, the, the transformations to French society during his reign. And, um, uh, but it also provided some interesting insights also on like his crusading and uh and, and things like that and, you know may, maybe some of the reasons why they they weren't successful and also uh kind of brought out too um and it and it it's encouraged me to look my my next uh acquisition is going to be um i actually want to uh see if i can get uh uh Jean V's, uh actual uh biography that he wrote of of louis the ninth um hmm. and uh uh, but it, it kind of talks about how Louis Crusades were not as unsuccessful. We're, we're not, they weren't as unsuccessful as people have maybe made them out to be um, in, in later years. And that, you know, especially in the time there, you know, there were some things that went down, uh, especially during the seventh crusade where um, it could have ended a lot worse and it didn't because there were other people there like, his wife, uh, uh, Margaret, Margaret of Provence, um, actually like took command of a lot of the forces that were left behind in Damietta and actually was able to, to pull off a pretty impressive, uh, fighting retreat out of Damietta, uh, where, you know, that it, it kind of saved the rest of the army. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting that, um, that there's just some interesting perspectives where it, it, it the, the idea of it being an absolute debacle and a disaster really came from the people who were back in France talking about it because they had put so much effort into it and there was so much hype over it. And they thought, you know, that it was going to be unstoppable and everything. And then it turned out to be kind of a disappointment. So um, it, it kind of got played up into this idea of, Oh, the whole thing was just an absolute disaster. And it was, it, it, there was nothing redeeming about it whatsoever. And <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I think it was well organized, and I mean, they they came pretty close to to achieving what they tried to achieve. But the problem was, you know, the defeat that came was pretty crushing. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they 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 took Damietta. They, you know, they 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 affected the landing, which that in itself was an achievement. It, the mm -hmm. whole thing was really well organized. I mean, that it would, but you know, the problem was. Uh, the march inland yep. which was then cut off i mean uh and, a lot and of they robert, robert robert of artois basically yeah. you know doing a leroy jenkins and and launching off on his own um with if they had gone for alexandria yeah. i kind of my opinion is kind of that you know i mean again like i think it's, it's really dangerous to assume that we can Think that we know more than these people knew at the time, but mm -hmm. I mean, we do know that his at his at the uh, military council they did um, 
everybody else wanted to go for Alexandria next, except for Robert. He was the one who yeah. was really gung ho about going for Cairo. And they would have taken Alexandria, I think. And I don't know, like in retrospect, I can almost see focusing on just establishing a Frankish state centered around Alexandria and Damietta. Right. And, you know, kind of incorporating that into just like controlling the whole coast of the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah. I mean, kind of, I think that, off the Nile you know, Delta, um, you know, yeah. And, and Alexandria, you know, there were already, there was already a sizable, um, there was already a, a sizable Italian mercantile presence there. So right, you know, yeah. it already would have had, you know, a, 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 a you know, a, a pretty impressive connection to Europe um, as a whole. So yeah, it, 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 you know, Alexandria could have turned into the Accra of Egypt. Um, and it, right. You of know, course yeah, the long-term it, goal was to get Jerusalem. Whereas I think, I think the goal should have been to, you know, to just beat the Muslims in general um, and, yeah. you know, just spread Latin civil, just, I mean, you know, get as much control with of Latin civilization as possible. But um, yeah. I don't know. It's it, interesting to think about. I mean, like if the goal, what if the goal had been more to establish a state in Egypt and just control the parts of Egypt that there were, were most uh, easily controlled by the Latin kingdoms, which, you know, the coast, uh, they dominated the the seas at the time, so I mean, I'm sure the the Muslims would have really contested that. They would have been like a really trying to to push back against that. But would they have really been able to? I mean, like if you yeah. if you if you control Alexandria and Damietta and you establish like some uh, fortifications to control the hinterland, I mean, I don't know. It's an interesting thing to think about. What do you guys in the chat think? Uh, yeah, let's let's jump over to some questions now. Um, uh, we got a bunch of good ones coming in. Uh, so Sam says, were the Fatimids a strong military force at the time to defend Alexandria? It seems like there's not much in English about their armies. Are you talking about the Seventh Crusade? Uh, the Seventh Crusade, the Fatimids were long gone. Saladin took out the Fatimids in the 1170s. So, but definitely in the early Kingdom of Jerusalem, yeah, the Fatimids were very powerful and had very good armies. Um, the Crusaders kind of, kind of ground them down over time. Yep. And um, Stephen Tibble uh, brings out uh, in his book, um, uh, The Crusader Armies. Um, I think that, yep. Um, <laughs> had to check my I bookshelf behind me to, to make sure. Um, uh, that's probably, if there was one book that really just drilled down into like the military history aspect of the Crusades, it would be that book. Um, and I, I strongly recommend that to everybody. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says in it, um, but he's but his his research was phenomenal, um, and, and he re he he really brought out some very very interesting points. But um, one thing he he brought out about the Fatimids themselves specifically was um, the Fatimids really had no um, th they had no uh, they they had very little connection to the actual native peoples of of the area where they ruled mm. over. They were a yeah, it was were, majority Sunni. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were they were a, they were a, a very small minority um and, and foreign minority. It's like the that. Turks. Yeah. Um Every, that's the thing. That's the funny thing about when, when people talk about the Crusades. The Crusaders, everybody they thought were also small minority groups, right. know, elite groups. I mean like right. oh the Crusaders were invading and it, the the fight against them was some kind of like popular uprising. No, not at all. Right. I mean they were, they were fighting warrior elites who also yep. were foreign to the area yep and and the, and it, it was one of the things that ended up kind of really weakening the fatimids was that that, that they you know that they they didn't have that connection to the the very people that they ruled over um and, and even a lot of their armies were were mostly um sunni for for, for, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term they were mostly like mercenaries from other places yeah um, there, there were like, uh, they had a large, they had Africans. large Armenian, yeah, Armenian mm -hmm. contingents. They had uh, Nubians. Uh, Nubians. Uh, it, 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 you know, so even Arabs. the people, even the people that fought for them weren't even like their own people. It was, it, it was, you know, they were just, they were basically just guys for hire, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you know, hire, hire, you know, sell swords essentially, um, and uh, just. just on a more uh, on a more permanent basis. Um, so yeah, it, it, it and and you see that story repeated often in the 
Islamic world in, in the Islamic medieval world a, a lot where there's this very small sort of ruling elite that are not native to the area that they are ruling over. And even their militaries aren't like their own people. They're, 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 you know, essentially uh, swords for hire from, from all over. Uh, and, and it, it was, it was an aspect, even, even, even Salah Hadin with his competent uh, political leaders, he was, even he had issues with that um, all throughout his his reign where, you know, he had various emirs who were not related to him or were not even part of his, you know, particular, uh, uh, you know, clan group or anything like that. And a lot of times, they, you know, there, there was very much a concern of they could just they could just kind of walk off and go home, you know, if they felt like it. Um, you also saw that with like uh, Kerboga of, of Mosul outside of Antioch, you know, he, he led this vast coalition of like all these different ethnic groups and all these different uh, from all over the, you know, the old caliphate. And when they showed up to Antioch and the, you know, the crusaders began rolling up on them hard. Um, a lot of them basically just were like, it, it was sort of every man for himself and they just peaced out <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and left him high and dry. Uh, so let's see here. Heath has a good question. What do you think of Dan Jones interpretation of the crusades? He seems very critical. I got to admit, I haven't, I don't really remember that much about what Dan Jones thinks about the crusades. My impression is that here's the problem though. With, like I get the, the idea that, that Dan Jones is kind of a lot of the, the sort of popular culture stuff about the crusades. Um, and a, a lot of the criticisms that come at the Crusades from that perspective, the, the problem the, is you can apply the, that to. Have you heard much much from him, like what he thinks? I mean, oh yeah, he, yeah. Tell yeah. me, Dan, tell Dan me Jones some, stuff, very much some the, stuff specifically about what he says. Yeah, he Dan Jones is very much the the uh, he, he's like he's he's the he's the historical academic who's trying hard to be a punk rocker or you know trying hard to be a pop star. Um, tattoos. He's, he's, yeah. He's a younger guy, you know, he's, he's, um, you know, he's got like, when you, when you see him in person, he's got like tattoos on his arms and stuff like that. Like, he, I mean, he, in some ways, and he's a, he, he is a good writer. I, I, I will absolutely give him that. Um, it, he's a very compelling writer. Um, I think, uh, I actually own one of his books. It's not one of the Crusades ones, but it's. Uh... I kind of think that in general. The, pro the problem with a lot of the criticisms that people like that make about the Crusades is they apply to any other group you're talking about in the medieval world. Like, I mean, you can apply that to the Seljuk Turks, to the yeah. to the, to the Muslim world in general. I mean, you know, Islam was, uh, you know, uh, a militant civilization that, that used conquest to, I mean... The Crusades were it, there, so there, yeah, his, much his criticisms against the Crusades the are very... Like what, yeah, his were, criticism were, were mean or yeah, his criticisms against the Crusades are very unimaginative. Like, like it's very, it, it's very, um, I, I guess at this point, uh, like it's, it's very Ridley Scott type but, stuff. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like it's it's the kind of stuff that like people have been saying for the last 60, 70 years now, and it, you know, it's just kind of like okay, here we go. You know, it's almost it's almost well, like, and know, also it's like a lot a of that stuff is so thing. untrue too. Like, I do, I think one of the things that people really try to use to criticize the crusades is uh the idea that like they also oppress the eastern christians which we know now that that's not true at all that the eastern christians were mm -hmm. totally had the same standing i mean they weren't part of the absolute ruling elite for the most part but even in some cases they were but right you know they, they were wealthy, they, yeah i mean there were yeah. there were queens who were who were armenian and stuff like that but they you know they could uh that they had uh, fiefs uh, in the army. They they received, uh, um, you know, that they had payments for that that made them wealthy. I mean, they were part of the military elite, like the Turk Opals were. So yeah. anyway, so let's. Yeah, I, I would say overall, Dan, Dan Jones is a very he's a very good writer. Um, the the book that I own of his is um, it's about the uh, uh, the 1381 Peasants Revolt um, in, in England, um, Summer of Blood, which was very very good and it was very well written. Um, and very well researched, but uh, um, when it comes to the Crusades, like his book on the Templars and all that kind of thing, it, it, it's very—you're not going to get anything out of it 
uh, in, in an academic sense, um, you're not going to get anything out of it that you're not going to get uh, in, in much better quality with other people. Um, and it's, 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 I would describe his academics as very, um, mundane, uh, and that's kind of about it. So he's not, like I said, he's not bad. And if you enjoy like a compelling story, um, then Dan Jones is very much a, a fun read. Um, but he's not, you're going to get something way better with, a, you know, if you're looking into the crusades, you're going to get something way better with a Jonathan Riley Smith or, uh, a, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, John Gillingham or, um, you know, even, even, you know, some of the other people that we featured on here and Andrew Latham or a Stephen Donaghy or, you know, somebody like that, you're going to get a lot more meat to it. Whereas, whereas Dan Jones is kind of, um, it's kind of history channel, I guess if I had to sum it up. <laughs> and let's see, Lambert asked this earlier. So I want to jump over this one, which, and by the way, if you guys want to do paid uh, questions, you can do that in the description below with power chat. Uh, I will be watching that just in case somebody wants to do that. And Lambert says, did Western European kingdoms use any military concepts of the East back in Europe post or during the Crusader States, such as Mamluk or Mongol strategies? The castles. So was yeah. that really? Yeah, Some but that wasn't, uh, that was, that was Western. That wasn't something that they brought back. It, from it was, it was military innovations that broke their teeth out in the East um, oh, I see what you're saying. And they cut yeah. their teeth out in the east, and then, and then, uh, the probably the greatest example of that would be Edward the First, um, who came back to England, um, and when he launched his final conquest of Wales, um, which, which uh, Wales has more castles per square mile than any other place in uh, in the world, but um, the castles that he built, uh, Beaumaris, uh, uh, Carnarvon, um, Canoe. Uh, What's the, what's the other what's the other, some of the other real famous ones um you know all of those were were designed off of the 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 military architecture that he encountered when he was on the the when, when he was out in the levant during the eighth crusade um yeah that makes sense and but in terms of like military tactics i know i i, I don't it, the, you know, the, the, the reason why the, the, the Eastern civilizations used the tactics that they did is because it, it, it fit with one that just their cultural approach to warfare and two with the, the, just the topography and just the way the land worked and what was available to them. You didn't have that in Europe. Um, you know, you didn't, it's one of the reasons why horde armies always fared very badly when they, when they actually made it into Western Europe, whether it was the Huns or, um, you know, people like that because they, it, the, 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 the land is not suited to horde warfare like that. It's not suited to the, the mass mounted, uh, hit and run skirmisher kind of tactics. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work there. Um, you also, it's also almost impossible to sustain, uh, in that area as well. You just, you, you, Western Europe does not have the ability to sustain, massive you know just from a logistical standpoint these massive uh mounted armies where you know each warrior needed like at least four horses or something like that and it was just um it just it just wasn't it, it wasn't feasible it's why it's why by the time the huns actually fought the the western romans and the visigoths at, at catalonian plains they were almost entirely dismounted by that point because they, they they'd lost almost all their they'd lost almost all their horses so we got Aries from the old Xena show here saying, what are your thoughts on Queen Elizabeth II's family being related to Muhammad, they say, from the Moors who intermarried with the Germans and English aristocrats? I've never heard that, and I don't think it's true. <laughs> I, I have never heard that either. That's, that's, that's a new one. That's, that's, that seems pretty kooky to me. Um, uh, let's see. Kissing Yoon, the Byzantines could afford that iconic cannon that was used in the Siege of Constantinople 1453, but Mehmed II was able to afford it. Yeah, he's talking about, they're talking about, um, this was up here farther. Um, same guy. Um, Ares asks about this Hungarian engineer who sold his cannons to the Ottoman Turks. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the Turks needed uh, needed Christians ultimately to conquer Constantinople. Like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah, or, I know. Or, yeah, I know. It's, it's it's kind of one of the it's kind of one of the darker sides of that story is the you know the the you know human human frailty, uh, especially when it comes to things like. Money yeah, or I mean, by then, by then it was kind of a matter of time anyway. I mean, yeah. at that point, I think the Turks pretty much controlled all the land around Constantinople, which. It's oh, they did. It was, crazy, it, was, it, was, it, was it was entirely cut off. They they had all the Balkans. They had most of Greece. Um, yeah, the best was, chance that the Byzantine Empire had was uh, the Fourth Crusade. If, if if Byzantium could have been incorporated into the Latin world, mm-hmm. then I think maybe there would have been a fighting chance long term. But because that didn't happen, you know, yeah. Yeah. we know what happened. Unfortunately. Uh, so Tony's saying it's a rabbit hole that has something to do with an Iberian monarch marrying a princess from Al Andalus who apparently descends from Muhammad. But what would that have to do with Elizabeth II? I, I do know that like they're oh okay, I guess because all the various like royal houses was because Catherine of Aragon was, was from Spain. And so well, like all of their like their whole like if you go back into like their like all the various royal lines that they're supposedly tangentially related to, I mean it's like it's virtually all of them them like it's, it's well and yeah also the idea that like any of the any of the arab uh elite in in muslim spain were were really interrelated to the iberian monarchies is just not true at all i mean there was a mm-hmm. we, we know that alfonso the sixth had a um he had like a moorish mistress or something but that wasn't where his his uh, heirs came from. I mean, the, the Christians didn't marry Muslims and then produce heirs. I mean, that just didn't happen. I mean, the best that the closest to that was that there were some of these guys took Moorish mistresses, but those children did not inherit any thrones. So, so yeah, Catherine, Catherine of Aragon was not related to any of the Moorish elite. Hmm who were reconquered by her ancestors. Yeah, that's a, I, yeah, that, that's one of those, uh, I think that'd be one of those, uh, citation please moments. Yeah. Like. <laughs> uh, Sam here says Orthodox rulers in the Balkans were quite willing to marry into the Ottoman elite. Well, they had to, I mean, uh, they were so, dominated by the ottoman that was really by choice yeah was, i mean uh... like, it's like it was almost like hostage uh, a hostage situation where yeah you've got to send like a couple of your daughters to be in the the ottoman harem i mean that's not and the the, the christians of spain were never in that kind of position and I, um were so i mean that's the, the thing it's funny people talk about like the interaction between the moors and the christians in in the Iberian Peninsula, and there was some of that, but there were just some very strict lines that were not crossed. And you know, the the Christian kings of Spain would uh, marry each other's children, but they certainly didn't marry the sons and daughters of the Moorish elite. Um, yeah, I, but, I I would agree. I would agree with that because there's there's really no, especially from the the sources from the times. There's there's no indication whatsoever that 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 was ever yeah. a thing culturally with them. Yeah. Sam says the Ottomans were far from gentle rulers to be sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. S- Sam that's, says that's, that's Balk- statement. Sam says the Balkan nobles were opposed to Latin alliances. Uh, some of them were, so some of them were, were, were more incorporated into the Latin world. Diogo says, were there many people from the Iberian peninsula fighting in the Holy land? Um, what jumps to mind for me is Arnold of Taroja, who was one of the grandmasters of the Templars, <laughs> who was, was he Portuguese or was he from s- somewhere else in the Iberian Peninsula? I can't remember. Spanish. Um, he was from, uh, I think he was from Castile, because his uh, as, uh, as grandmaster of the Templars actually had the, you know, the, the little tower, um, uh, you know, the tower device uh, on his. Uh, okay, yeah, he's his, got a Castilian. He was a knight of the crown of Aragon and the ninth grand master of the Knights Templar. That's cool. Um, okay. So yeah, so there, there was him uh, and there was also um, now this is uh, several of the of the participants in the First Crusade who were from southern France uh, like uh, 
Gaston of Bern, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's those later in these regions. Yeah, later went on to join uh, the ranks of Alfonso the Battler, who, of course, is a famous um, crusading king from the Iberian Peninsula, the King of Aragon. Uh, so a lot of the guys involved in the First Crusade were involved in his crusades, which were some of the earliest uh, crusades in Spain, like with sanctioned bulls from yep. the papacy. So that's well, I think uh, I think the one that was sanctioned by uh, Gregory the Seventh, uh, by Pope Gregory the Seventh, you know, long, long before Clermont or you know Urban the Second or anything like that, um, mm -hmm. that was where a very young, um, a very young uh, Raymond of of, uh, of Toulouse. Uh, right. fought, fought in so i mean he was of all the leaders of the of the first crusade raymond was the only one who had actually participated in what could be called like the sort of the proto crusading um that was going on in spain um and uh and and thereby had a you know pretty decent standing with the the papacy at the time um because of that and and i think if i recall correctly i think he even briefly served under under uh, Rodrigo de Vivar. I think I think he very briefly fought alongside the Cid um, as a young man. I I think. Oh, uh, are you talking about Alfonso the Battler? Uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about uh, Raymond uh, of, okay. of Toulouse. Um, when he was Alfonso the Battler definitely did. He was uh, one of the younger sons in uh, the royal house of Aragon, and his father or grandfather was an ally to the Cid, and he was probably at the Battle of uh, the Second. Not. It may have been Quarta or Byren, um, one of El Cid's big battles. He was there as a young man, so he may have learned some stuff from El Cid, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, and there was a lot of cross-cultural interplay between um, the Southern French, especially the the extreme Southern French. So the you know the mm -hmm. Gascons, the um, the uh, the Languedoc, um, and the Northern Spain, you know what would be considered Navarre and Aragon and um, those places, all those, all those sort of Pyrenaic areas, they all, they all very much intercrossed with each other for, you know, quite a bit of their history. Um, so they, they, they would have had a lot of, you know, there, there would have been a lot of cross Pyrenees relationships, uh, you know, between the Southern French and the Northern Spanish. And Sam says my presumed ancestor, the despot of Serbia was part of the Polish forces at Vienna, which is cool. That is cool, Sam. Sam, you look very Serbian, which is which is a compliment. Um, the, the Serbs, uh, for especially during the medieval period, you know, when the the Ottomans were very first starting to come in and whatnot, the Serbs were actually um, some of the more pro Western of the yeah. Balkan states that were in there. They 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 actually um, they actually took quite a bit. Um, they actually received quite a bit of support from the papacy and um, other things for them fighting off the, the 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 Turks as hard as they did. They they proposed alliance an alliance against the Byzantines with Frederick Barbarossa when he was coming through there, which he probably should have yeah. taken them up on and just right. Barbarossa, <laughs> yeah. should have, Barbarossa should have gone ahead and right. just uh, done the Fourth Crusade in 1189. Honestly, in my <laughs> possibly just yeah, yeah. Uh, just. Get that wrapped up a little early. Um, D is telling us that uh, Toroja's tomb was found in Verona in 2018. That's pretty cool. I would huh. like to go check that out. That may be one of the few uh, grandmasters whose tombs we have. For uh, maybe I'm wrong yeah. about that. I don't know, but that'd be cool to. That'd be really. Well, I'm surprised that I'm surprised that he ended up in Verona. Um, I wonder. If yeah, I mean, I guess you know the papacy is is in Italy, so I you know there's that connection, but. Yeah. It does seem kind of like a surprise. You'd think he'd be either in the Holy Land or in, in Spain. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Huh. Um, let's see here. And Sam, our other Sam, I'm a historian of the Ottoman Empire. That's pretty cool. Oh, nice. um, okay. is, is that something you do professionally? Um, because it'd be cool to have you on to talk about that sometime. Um, Aries says, Stephen, can you do a video series on the Muslims conquering Christian lands in the seventh century? What started it all? I would like to see you do the history on that. That would be cool. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of not as interesting as some of the later history, just because the source material is so sketchy and it's just kind of like, okay, then uh -huh. they conquered this, they conquered this, they conquered this. And there's like a little bit of detail you can 
get in there. But yeah, the sources for that those periods are pretty sparse. Yeah. Um, even the even the way it's described in in you know some of the Islamic religious texts, it's 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 almost kind of yeah. like the old it's it's like the Old Testament. You know, it's it's just like. Um, and then this king conquered this king, and then this king conquered mm -hmm. this king, and you just it, like there's no detail whatsoever. <laughs> it's, yeah, which the um, early early medieval sources are kind of like that in general, like the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, which basically like the Viking stuff is like, and then the Vikings attacked, and then and then the Vikings attacked again, and then they yeah. came and attacked again, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then people coming from. <laughs> um, let's see here. I know some of the some of the Byzantine chronicles from that time. So uh, you know, like the yeah. life of Heraclius and and things like that. They they shed some more detailed light onto it. Um, but even then, you know, they're coming at it from the you know these are usually like imperial you know uh, chroniclers and and stuff like that. So it's still all going to be very very you know ha hagiographic and um, all that. So yeah, it's it, it is the, the the source materials make it difficult. Let's see here, Tony. Um, I would like to do something. Yeah, I think he's talking. You're talking about the fact that, and one of the reasons they can kind of sometimes get away with the idea that the early Muslim conquests were like just everybody just throwing their doors open and saying, "Yes, please come rule over us," um, is because of how sparse the source material is. But I mean, it all makes clear that these were brutal conquests. I mean, like, for example, Spain, um, the Muslims themselves, when they talk about the conquest in Spain, you know, talk about, you know, massacring certain populations and taking uh, women as tribute or whatever. I mean, you know, this is, we know that these early conquests were, were rough. I mean, they were not like, um, I remember there were some videos on YouTube a while back where people were arguing that well, the Crusades were violent, but uh, the early Islamic conquests were were not violent. I mean, like like not violent. I mean, you know, conquest is conquest. It's yeah. it's not that different. War warfare through the vast majority, even even all the way up into our own times. War warfare is yeah. is, is an extremely brutal, ugly affair, and and, exactly. it's, and it always yeah. has been, and it always will be. And anybody who tries to say that, you know, oh well, you know everybody else's conquests were, were awful and brutal and Except horrible, but, yeah. but, but yeah, but ours weren't. Okay. You know, that's, that's, that's yeah. not how it works. That's, that's not how history works. That's, that, that, that's somebody who's trying to, they're, they're not doing history. They're doing ideology. And that's, that's, you know, which is fine. You can be an ideologue and that's, and that's, you know, all small and fine, but don't pretend that you're a historian, you know, cause you're not. So. All right, guys, we're going to kind of, um, wind it down now and uh, call it a day, but we'll, we'll have to have Rand come back again for one of these um, couple. Let's take a couple more questions. Then we'll, we'll shut her down for now. Um, I'm going to jump through some of these up here. Um, so Sam is telling us that he is doing Ottoman military history in Turkey. That right. is pretty cool. All right. And uh, Chris is talking about the Islamic conquest of India. Indeed. And Sam is pointing out that St. Nicholas is in Barrie, Italy. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Gregory the Seventh is buried in Norman country down in southern Italy, too, which I would like to go check out his his final resting place. Yeah, I think I think because he died he, when he died, he was uh, he was once again having to take refuge from. Oh, yeah. Uh, like pro -imp pro imperial forces that had taken over Rome. Uh, yeah, I think he was buried in Salerno. I think it was. But, yeah, that makes um, sense. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let me see here. I'm just gonna look through some of these up here, but yeah, guys, throw us one or two more questions, and then we'll. Uh, like Bleak is saying, it was just getting good. So <laughs> <laughs> give us one more question, Bleak, and then we'll we'll call it a day. There we go. I was kind of scrolling through some of this stuff up here, but. Uh, Oh, no. What's uh so other than your fourth crusade video? What's uh what what what's in the shoot for you? Uh, um, I'm thinking I'm gonna do some. So I did this video that was really successful about the second Mongol invasion of Hungary, and so I'm thinking I'm gonna do mm. something about the third Mongol invasion of Poland, and it's gonna be called 
how Poland finally defeated the Mongols. Nice. That seems to be something that gets people. That, get pe I gets actually watched attention. that. that I, the, good. Yeah, the video that you're talking about, I, I actually watched that. That was really, really good. And it, and it, and it, it brings up a, 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 a it, it focuses on an aspect of the, the Mongol era that, uh, I'll, that almost nobody else focuses on. And that is that the, the Mongols, you know, everybody has, everybody has this idea and it's been popularized by, uh, you know, Churchill and, and so many others were like, you know, oh, the only thing that saved Western Europe from the Mongol hordes was the Khan dying and, and everybody leaving. And it's like, yeah. no, that's kind of not true, like at all. The, 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 mm -hmm. the Mongols, they had some very initial successes, mostly because they were fighting against guys who had no idea who they were or like where they'd come from or, or what, or, you know, how they fought or anything like that. And it was still out in the steppes of sort of Eastern Central Europe where they, you know, their military tactics were, were still supreme. Had they continued pushing further westward, that they would have ended up in the same situation that the Huns ended up in when, when they got into Western Europe. And that was they found out that, that the style of warfare that they were accustomed to didn't work um, out there. And, they, and not only did it, could it not work, they couldn't even sustain themselves, uh, you know, sustain their vast herds. Um, uh, of horses, and they they would have started losing them. Um, so you know, and by that time, Western Europe was in a far better uh, situation, you know, far far better, uh, you know, social and, and political situation than they were at the, you know, in the in the early four hundred, you know, in the mid four hundreds at the you know the end of the the Western, you know, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Um, so, the, yeah, this idea that that the Mongols and actually when I was in grad school, uh, I, I actually took a, <laughs> a, a Chinese military history course and I actually Check wrote a whole paper. Look at this, Ryan. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's true. You know? Come to the mountains right. and get your ass kicked. Um, Come but, to the mountains uh, and get your ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I wrote, I, I wrote a whole paper on this about how, you know, that there's this misconception that the Mongols would have just run over Western Europe and, and right. uh, that's, it's really not true. Um, at I, was, all. I was actually listening to a lecture by a guy who's like a specialist in, in the Mongols. And he was talking about this. He was talking about how like uh, when the even when, you know, the, the first invasion of Hungary was successful. I mean, they destroyed a bunch of stuff, but the Battle of Mahi was tough for them to win. And they they ran into a lot of resistance that caused them exactly. to have a lot of casualties. And he was also saying how in the West, kind of like this guy was saying up here, come to the mountains and get your ass kicked. <laughs> In the West, a lot of the fortresses were up in mountains, um, mm -hmm. and that was really hard for the Mongols to deal with, apparently. So, yeah, I think the idea that um, the Mongols could have easily just taken over the West, I, I think pretty much the evidence shows that's not true at all. So, yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's um, let's kind of call it a day for now, guys, and we'll jump back on Tuesday and we'll do, you know, 11 a.m. Uh, Central Time, noon Eastern time. So join us on Tuesday and uh, hope everybody has an excellent weekend. And I'm going to uh, jump back to work here. So we'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, Rand, thanks for hanging out, buddy. Hey, as always, it's, uh, it, it, it's always a treat. All right. Okay.